change my topic name somewhat just because in some senses what I'm beginning to see from my client base is if I call things something to do with finance, I'm sorry Daniel, I'm really gonna mess with your PR here. If I call stuff something to do with finance, the vast majority of people, Tim, finance isn't my job. And actually Bev and I had this discussion uh, last night where in fact she has a team who can do financial accountability for her. She doesn't necessarily have to be the expert in it. I actually think the UK experience is not going to be the same as the Australian experience. Financial accountability and understanding the way your enterprise actually delivers human rights at a price point under an NDIA framework is going to be important to everybody in this room, not just the pencil-headed accountants. Okay? So if you remember nothing else, getting financially disciplined may actually be a really big part of your transition to an NDIS. Um, and if you don't, you probably do need to mind the gap. <coughs> Alright, so what are we going to be covering together? Here are the key things we are going to be covering. We are going to be doing some recent news from the NDIA because some of this stuff has real substance for you guys as suppliers. What you design as products, how you look to invest over the next three years or so, and how you go about the process of uh, managing change. With my sessions, I'm a little different. Um, if you've got questions, please ask them on the fly, okay? Um, chances are, if you're uh, wanting to ask a question, um, there's a whole bunch of other people who haven't, so uh, please uh, feel free to go through the process of asking questions. I have got copies of the slides here, but I'm not gonna give them to you. So you actually have to focus on what I'm saying rather than what's written on the notes. You can see me afterwards for copies if you want. What's the recent news that you should be mindful of in terms of the next two to three years? First thing, Progress report from the chair. Uh, Bruce bonner Haiti, the chair of NDIA, is actually a guy for whom this is personal. He is a very courageous man who is very, very bright and who is trying to do the right thing through a very, very large scheme. And you do well to download his transcript and read it carefully for context. Here's the link. Please make sure you read it. But for those who don't read, let's go through the process of a cheat sheet. A couple of really important themes that he talks about. First thing, the vision of the scheme is to maximise independence, social and economic participation. What are the key messages in that particular statement that might be very, very new for people operating under a DHS framework? Oh, and by the way, I don't do rhetorical questions. What are the key messages? Economic. Economic? This may be Australia's largest work for the doll scheme. The PC report talks about 100,000 new jobs for people on DSPs at full wages by the time 2050 rocks around. If our analysis is right, actually that number may well be 100% understated. That's a big priority for the agency, economic participation. Comes up in the other five speeches that I'll refer to shortly. NDIA is able to continually improve by operating like an insurance scheme. This isn't really DHS's strong point, is it? Is it? Continuous improvement? Don't operate like an insurance scheme. Um, using rich data and continual actuarial assessments of cost and effectiveness. Is that the current framework you are dealing in? Our door goes block funding. Yeah. Uh, block funding has exited the building. Yes, absolutely. This is individualised. This is very accountable. And this is actually taking into account someone's lifetime costs of support. It isn't about a year of funding or limiting the year of funding, it's actually about looking at the long term. So that, that enables you as an organisation to think about early intervention and investing up front to reduce or defer support costs in the longer term, but it also requires you to think carefully about innovation and about your outcomes per dollar of input. Really, really important stuff. Second thing, data analysis to improve cost control and streamline process. What is the chair trying to flag here, folks? Yep. Damn right, we've got to get more cost effective. We've got to get more efficient and effective at what we do, absolutely. If you were... Does that mean cheaper? Ah, no. Efficient and effective does not automatically mean cheaper. Very important differential. If you can go through the process of delivering exactly the same service for greater quality, that is something that fits within this characteristic. If you can go through the process of deferring a requirement for support or reducing a requirement for support over time because someone is more independent in their own life, more active in their own life, that is an important thing as well and actually fits beautifully with this stuff. It isn't about a race to the bottom necessarily, although some suppliers I suspect will get sucked into a price war. 
The really interesting thing here is, if you talk to the actuaries who are largely driving the thought, um, the thought leadership of the scheme, they will actually very openly say, if we are about to spend 14 billion additional dollars in this industry, we expect to get a leveraged advantage. We expect you guys to be more efficient at what you do by stretching your overheads further. What does that mean for your, your organisation? It's an interesting question. Um, yeah, we've already talked about lifetime care and support. This is the other thing that he talks about in his, uh, in his speech. He talks a lot about comparing NDIA with Medicare. He talks about Medicare and whether you believe that high caps and Medicare is this or not. He talks about Medicare being efficient, trusted and unobtrusive. Now he effectively says, as a board, this is the type of NDIA that we want to deliver. If that's the type of market maker that Australia is going to depend on, what does it mean for the shape of the suppliers? that you guys need to be in the short, medium and long term, do you think? Sorry? Efficient, trusted and unobtrusive. Yeah. You need to actually think about what it's going to take for your organisation to be efficient, trusted and unobtrusive. Mm. I actually think quite a few of your businesses perhaps don't fit that criteria. Um, I guess there are some homework questions. You will never leave a session with me without homework questions. So for those who are brave enough to pick up the pack, you are condemned to do this as homework, please. These are your homework questions. I won't actually go through the process of uh, labouring them right now. Um, recent news... Jim, we'll go back to efficient, trusted and unobtrusive and you said most people aren't. What do you mean? Okay. How many times have disability in Victoria hit front page of the newspaper in the last 12 months? few times, isn't it? How many times have people publicly, either from the agency or from the federal government, referred to a cottage industry approach in, in this particular uh, support platform? Are they right about that? Well, if you look at the Victorian supply framework, roughly 50% of the CSO delivered support in this uh, state of Victoria is in fact delivered by 11 suppliers. The remaining support, the remaining 50%, is actually delivered by how many suppliers? 300. 347 at last count. It looks like a cottage industry to me, and in some senses some of those cottage industries are actually very efficient, very effective, and actually very trusted by their own constituents. But you've got to understand that the federal constituency wants to deal with scaled businesses that have evidence of their effectiveness and very few of those really micro businesses actually have good solid evidence of effectiveness of practice and efficiency of delivery. You've got to understand that. I'm not sizest. I don't care whether you're small, big or medium size. I don't care. I do care very deeply that you look outstanding at what you do, that you've got great evidence to prove that you're effective and that you can do it at a dollar base that is consistent with the way that the market will deliver in future. And having said that, you know, a lot of these 300 uh, institutions have been non-for-profit. We've been on the base block funded approach. We could do our little chook raffles to get it through. Now we're going to the business model and uh, it's, it's and the board now, uh, most of the board members have to be board members with the portfolios. And you know, the regional Victoria, I don't know if it's different in the city, but it's a different approach again. So it is scaring a lot of people in this business approach. One of the really important things that you're going to need to grapple with as not-for-profits, particularly the smaller ones, is purpose. We predominantly, as not-for-profits, existed previously for failed markets and in failed markets. Effectively, we were what stood between our users and a very, very bad lifestyle outcome, right? But in a market that theoretically delivers reasonable and necessary supports at appropriate dollar cost at reasonable times by good providers, what value do you have to add as a not-for-profit? What is your unique value proposition? It becomes really funky. That is one of the things that we'll talk about a little bit later in the session. Yep. It's interesting to know that there's only 1% difference between the for-profits and not-for-profits currently registered. Do you think that's going to be down 27%, 26%? Yeah, this is actually a really good point for the purposes of those who couldn't hear that. There have been a really big, there's been a really big blossoming of for-profits, uh, particularly small ones, um, in the trial sites, particularly here in, uh, in Barwon and in Hunter. Fascinating thing. Um, if you have a look at the way that brokered service happened here in Victoria via financial intermediaries, predominantly Moira, uh, in the past, before NUIA actually existed, where did most of that service actually get brokered to? More than half of it got brokered 
to the full profits. Typically, very flexible, very light, very, light, very fast, um, very cheap for profits who are very willing to meld and mould as required. Um, in some senses, do I fear the for profit, not for profit thing? Nope. Outstanding operators will prevail if they are able to deliver genuine human rights, genuine choice, genuine flexibility and control, genuine lifestyle and relationship at a price point in ways that people actually want. That's the last thing is the fascinating thing for me. Not-for-profits typically aren't very good at market analysis. They're not very good at figuring out where their products sit compared to their other competitors. Yeah. The other part of the market is local government and hack services and the longitudinal stuff that they've done in their community. So they get kicked right out of the market because of the price mm -hmm. differentiation. So we've just done uh, an intervention for a client uh, who happens to be um, one of uh, Victoria's largest local government areas. And they were looking at the under 65 hack market, which effectively might transition to tier two in NDIA, or might not. Fascinating thing with hack is this. No one understand that under the Local Government Act, those local governments, those councils actually have community service obligations. And effectively, if there is a gap, if there is a failure of the market that isn't met by NDIA or NDIS, or NIIS for that matter, do they have an obligation to step into that gap? Well, I tend to think legally they probably do. Fascinating thing, the group tender that you're seeing in the Western Districts, where nine councils have effectively tried to outsource their hack packages um, in the very short term, probably suggests that they think I'm wrong. Watch that space because Hack is one of those support services where council has effectively used some of their ratepayer resources to top up where state funding, federal funding has failed. Um, many of you probably actually do Hack services. If you do, um, this is a really interesting and challenging market. Watch this space and manage it carefully um, because in the very short term, I think you'll probably get a whole bunch of work shifted your direction without adequate financial return. Into the local government space? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. And so each and every one of you that pays rates, that's where it's going to go. Probably enough on that for the time being. Um, <laughs> Um, but a good, a good series of uh, uh, introductory bits and pieces. Um, price lists. Everyone loves a good price list. I know I do. Um, every time the NDIA uh, puts out a price list, I actually tuck away an entire weekend to devour it. Um, no, just me. Okay, all right. Um, in terms of uh, the most recent release of price lists, here's the uh, big picture. Effectively, for the first time in living memory, there is an open use of the, this kind of language. They are focusing on value for money relative to the benefits achieved and the costs of alternatives. They want to get bang for buck. Okay? Do you think you as an organisation represent good bang for buck? It's a nice, nice, uh, nice question. For the first time in a publicly released paper by the agency, they very clearly focus on the meeting of development needs, the delivery of goal attainment, and actually being accountable for a lifestyle to be delivered. This is a breakthrough moment because they've tied it very clearly to remuneration, uh, which is really quite cool. Ah, this is another really cool thing that a few of you probably have been arguing about for some time. There, for the first time, has been a statement from the agency that says co-payments from some participants may in fact be legal. This is very important for those of you who claim to be high quality, but really, really high cost. Because effectively, it may be that if someone wants to pay more for a high quality good or service, they may choose to. Fascinating thing, how many of your clients actually have the capacity to pay the difference between the cluster prices and what you would have to charge them to remain as a high quality provider? Interesting series of questions, I think. Um, not going to labour this too much because the vast majority of you are already aware of this, but um, the efficient price concept. Um, many of you have seen the efficient price concept paper uh, that has been put together by uh, our friends at the NDIA, and effectively you know and understand that it is based on a modern award and not a dollar more. It's based on allegedly the best available data, um, and it's to be indexed by the Equal Remuneration Order and Annual uh, Wage Reviews over the intervening three years between now and 16. For those playing the game at home, this slightly unreadable slide 
is probably one of the most important bits of data that you may actually not be able to read um, from where you are. First thing, um, the vast majority of the prices are actually based on a pay point which is Modern Award 2.3, uh, substantially lower than what, the, what you're paying most of your DSWs. That is the first challenge. The second challenge is client facing efficiency. Under an NDIA model, you don't get the chance to bill <coughs> hours that are not with the client. And effectively, this model is built on your DSWs being client facing between 90 and 95% of their time for community inclusion services. It's an interesting set of assumptions that. Um, the question down the back in the first session about stands of control is really important effectively. Uh, the efficient, efficient price frontier um, has been put together on a SACS 3.2 model, which is effectively paying someone $1.70 an hour to supervise, at more than these guys, to supervise and set the tone at the top for your services. And they've got a span of control of 1 to 15, increasing to 1 to 18 over time. Oh, and the good news for all the accountants in the room, corporate overhead is effectively benchmarked at uh, a, a generous, I think, 15% um, currently, decreasing to 10% and possibly to 8% in the longer term. How does most of that make you feel? Hmm? Sorry? We're supposed to be excited. Yeah, you're supposed to be excited, but in fact, this is a really significant challenge for you, right? This is hard because it doesn't look like anything that you've ever played with before. Here's a fascinating thing. Um, in the trial, we have observed two patterns of behaviour in reaction to this. One is to cross arms, stomp feet, and generally get fairly angry. The second is to say, well, okay, if that is reality, let's have a think about the creative ways to make this potentially work in ways that honour human rights. Is that even possible? Is the rational response to simply remove ourselves from this particular bit of the market and not offer this service? After all, the key advantage that you have as a supplier to NDIA is to say no. I simply put this in the presentation to say this is the lived reality. You have three years or less to actually ready your business to actually deliver against these types of disciplines. So one is probably well placed to spend that next, let's call it, three years very wisely and very carefully. Um, deregulation was deferred. This is a really cute one from the pricing paper. Deregulation was deferred, but uh, it isn't a, the, the cluster prices aren't a prescribed price, but you are able to charge below the efficient market price. <laughs> I don't really get the gag. It's not a market. It's not really a market, is Chris's response. She's actually right. Um, this is not a market, this is actually a this is a command market, not a demand market. And the fascinating thing is, um, what is the classic example of a demand uh, of, a co of a command market? It's a communist economy. Um, not that I'm comparing NDIA to a communist economy. Um, moving on, there are some homework questions in there for you. Um, other things to be really, really uh, aware of. Um, Monday this week, Anglicare released a report. Um, for those of you who do respite, you do well to read this report because it is of significance for you. In it, they basically criticise the agency uh, for being too focused on the participant and not focused enough on familial resilience. Um, for mine, this is actually probably um, the precursor to what could be a legislative reframe, which actually says we need to recognise that costs in the long term for the scheme will actually be a function of how well families stick together and how well they provide informal unpaid supports. Um, any of you guys provide mental health support at all? One organisation, two, three, four, yeah, okay, a few. Um, background PDRSS, so Victorian government rate uh, for um, mental health at the moment is between 85 and 92. Uh, the fascinating thing in the NDIA is it is being funded as an inclusion service at 36.75. There's a big difference between those two numbers, ladies and gents. So in some senses, uh, there has been some critique and uh, some feedback on that stuff. Um, the KPMG implementation advice, um, look, I'd recommend that you read at least the executive summary here. You are leaders, please be readers. Um, the KPMG implementation advice actually took a swing at a whole bunch of stuff. I'm not going to go through this terribly uh, much, but to pick out the eyes of it. They want clarity on pricing? Yeah, me too. Um, they have concerns about interfaces between the scheme and mainstream uh, systems, absolutely. They have a they've flagged the elephant in the room, which is actually the housing stock question. 
Um, for those of you playing at home, here in Victoria, how many additional places are likely to emerge out of the NDIA full implementation post 16 for people with accommodation supports? Did anyone read the last quarterly report? The answer is between three and 4,000 additional places. If you extrapolate that Australia-wide, the number is gigantic because in fact, Victoria is very well serviced and supported by housing stock. So, um, where's, where are these houses gonna come from? I think this is a key opportunity set for those of you who are interested in delivering genuine lifestyles for people living with a disability in the longer term. Um, but it's actually a really tricky nut to crack. I've been working on it. Um, not going to go through this too much because we're probably going to run out of time regardless, but um, my challenge for you is this. Very few organisations in this industry actually have good, solid, clear, well thought through structures in terms of change and change management. How many of you guys actually have access to a change manager or someone who's done a lot of change management in a structured way in the organisation? One, two, are you guys from the same organisation? Okay, so three organisations in the room, at best, have access to that kind of skill. You're about to go through one of the largest changes that this industry will see in the next, let's call it 150 odd years. This is Medicare on steroids, so let's make sure that you get the change right, okay? If you don't have a change management framework, please get one and go through the process of, uh, I guess, prioritising the areas that you need to, uh, to learn about and work through in the very, very short term. Um, probably enough on the key learnings from, uh, sorry, the, the key news stories in terms of flavour. And I actually present that piece of this presentation simply to say there is much to know, but there is much that is being told to you about how you need to model your business, how you need to change your business, how do you need to perhaps reform your business in the very short term by some of the new news that's coming out. So please read that stuff very carefully. Right, now. As an accountant, I quite often get asked, well, okay, in terms of NDIS uh, adaptation and in terms of the things that we need to think about, what are the key ten big things that we see emerging from the trial sites that actually have a financial or uh, behavioural context to them? Here's the thing, almost none of these have only a finance element to them. Finance is just a way of keeping score, folks. Um, it actually records your behaviour clinically and in support behaviour. So in some senses, most of this should interest most of you, I think. Mining the gap, well, I guess what I'm saying in terms of mind the gap, current state does not equal future state. There is a gap here. You need to be aware of planning that gap uh, and dealing with it. Well, the top 10, well, these are they. Uh, purpose, efficiency, inclusion, exclusions, uh, effectiveness systems, working capital cash flow, Participant engagement, I could actually re, re, uh, refer to that as uh, co-design, I guess. Uh, competitive positioning, market convergence and workforce. Um, let's go through them really, really briefly uh, just now. In terms of purpose, we talked a little bit about this before, but I have sat with a number of not-for-profit boards recently who are in disability, who are in mental health and who are in aged care. And they are wondering why they should persist. Previously, they have existed largely because the market has failed and effectively their mandate as a board was to fix the things that needed fixing. Okay, that was, that was how they operated as a governance body. In future, you are effectively going to become a professional services firm delivering lifestyle and human rights in a way that is fully remunerated by an external and independent third party and who listens to your key participants <coughs> before you get a chance to form a relationship with them. It's a fundamental change. You are going to have to look at strategically designing best fitting supports rather than just fixing all the things that need to be fixed. In terms of purpose for your organisation, how do you change from being someone who is all about a failed market to something that is competing in a well-run commercial market? Let me give you another practical example of how this might work. How many of you receive donations every year? One organisation receives donations. Two, possibly three, maybe four. Okay, great. Well, maybe the people have, uh, have been to go a little less generous than I thought they were. Um, fascinatingly enough, do you think your donations will go up or down in the NDIS future? Down. Why? Because effectively, people are aware that they are giving half a percent of their Medicare levy to this scheme. 
I've paid my due here, you've got what this scheme is worth, why should I continue to give to you? Because ultimately this is not a failed market anymore. You have $14 billion of new money in this scheme, why is it that you are asking me for more money? That's a practical example of this purpose piece. I guess my question in some sense is for the not-for-profits in the room, is do you actually still have a purpose if in fact you are just competing as a professional services firm in a commensurate market? Interesting series of questions. There are some homework questions in your pack, please do them carefully, particularly if you happen to be a board member or an executive leader here. This is just a nice neat little diagram that our friends at the NDIA published some time ago. This may help you in actually focusing on your changing role in this particular environment. Previously, this is where you guys hung out. Effectively, you had this cosy little arrangement where the government effectively said, please run these programs for us and please go through the process of delivering something to the participants. They don't really get to choose, but you know, keep, try and keep them alive, try and keep them happy, okay? This is the new environment where effectively, the participant is the centre of all that we do and actually gets to choose the supports that they want to purchase. The money and the power resides with the participant, not with you. Important relationship difference here that does cause and underline some of the, uh, the, the purchase or the, the purpose uh, yeah. issues. Yeah. What about the power of the NBIA that's actually distorting that central person? <sighs> Great question. Chris's question was, what about NDIA and the fact that they're, they're, missi they're messing with this particular scheme because they're effectively uh, overstepping some of their rights and obligations here and making decisions. There is some growing evidence that they, some of their planners are making decisions on behalf of <coughs> participants in a way that may not necessarily be helpful. Um, I expect that to settle down over time as the scheme matures, as the planners mature, as the frameworks mature, and as suppliers over here also get much better at doing the relationships intelligently with participants before the planning, uh, the planning discussion actually happens. Um, however, that is a news story for most of you because how much do you invest in your relationships currently? Be honest with me, how much do you really invest in relationships with your clients? I suspect the answer is not very much or not deliberately anyway. Okay? Um, very, very important questions that you need to do uh, in terms of homework. Efficiency. This is not an accident that uh, efficiency is the second on my tick list. How efficient do you think you are as a business in this particular industry? Do you think you are world's best practice in terms of delivering <coughs> human rights outcomes on a per dollar basis? No. No is the universal answer of almost everybody sitting in this room. Now I've got to say, as someone who is an uncle of someone <coughs> with, living with a profound disability, I've got to say, I agree with you. And that makes me very angry. I have a right to be angry because it's actually the participants' money that you are potentially wasting in some circumstances. And that is immoral and unethical. From my perspective, as someone who audits a hell of a lot of businesses in this particular market, at the moment, you don't have a disciplined workforce mix at all. You effectively allow people who like to work together to work together, regardless of their seniority or the roles or the values that they are actually adding to the client. It is bollocks technical accounting term. Um, spans of control we talked about earlier. At the moment, you have accidental spans of control. I have one client uh, within my client base who actually um, has some case managers who actually supervise about 4,000 delivered client hours. And in the same business, they have case managers who manage about 10 times that number. Somebody sitting on their rear end not doing very much. And I don't think it's fair for, for participants to actually cop that. I think that's a bit of a, a, bit of a pity. Improvement by accident is something that really ticks me. What do I mean by improvement by accident? Well, at the moment, most of my commercial businesses take consistent improvement very, very seriously. And what you heard from Bev earlier and from Ian as well is that actually we do incremental improvements as part of our culture over time. It's something that we take seriously. At the moment, most of you are doing improvement by accident. And actually, the vast majority of those accidents, unless they're made accountable, as you heard from Bev and Ian earlier, actually disappear very rapidly over time, don't they? Someone has a bright idea, it gets implemented for a very short period of time, and then it disappears because ultimately no one makes somebody accountable for actually delivering that right across the organisation. Um, yeah, let's talk about this. In terms of the efficiency piece, 
How, how many of you are excited by the transitional price of 37, 36 or 37 bucks? The answer is very few, right? If that is the reality, what is it that you need to do to get more fit, to get more lean, to get more efficient and still deliver good quality human rights over time? How do we optimise our human rights per dollar spent? How do we optimise our overheads? How do we improve efficiency? And actually, who owns this in your organisation has become a critical, critical challenge, I think. Mm. Wasn't going to do this slide, but it's in here, so I may as well, may as well do it. In terms of how much profit is enough, most of you are sitting there going, well, okay, we're not going to get capital grants, we're not going to get donations, so therefore we've got to make profit to make ourselves relevant in the future. Good, well done you. How much profit is enough? What should you be aiming for? I'm not really in the business of telling other people how much business profit they should be making, but what I would observe is the difference here between not-for-profit aged care and for-profit aged care. There is a full 6% difference in the net profit margins achieved by these two businesses, and I'm curious about that. They have to comply with the same quality standards, they have to do the same support, and yet one is making 6% more profit a year. Why do you think that is? Sorry? Less toilet paper? No, toilet paper is not going to make that difference. It's rounding error. What else? They're more efficient. They're more efficient. I actually think what you're exhibiting here is two things which I find very interesting. First thing, they are more disciplined than some of their not-for-profit peers. But the second thing is they are probably more risk tolerant as well. How many board members in not-for-profit aged care are willing to see their face splashed on the front of the local newspaper? The answer is very few, right? So effectively, when you look at the non-compliances and enforceable undertakings between not-for-profit aged care and for-profit aged care, enforceable undertakings happen at almost three times the rate in for-profit providers as they do in not-for-profits. I actually think in some senses, the NDIA change in terms of efficiency for your boards will be a significant challenge because they will need to understand, yes, you do need to get far more disciplined at what you do, but you also need to get more risk tolerant, more capable of taking enterprise risk and actually being a bit innovative. Um, Sorry, Tim, just a question on that. So uh, we're looking at the, uh, the risks. In our industry, it's about dignity risk and duty of care. Okay, so uh, it's always been around, around for many, many, many years. So if you're risk taking, so if you're giving opportunities to your participants, but then they have an example that they've not going off to do um, uh, independence with a small group without any staff support, yet in the guys won't fund that because the person, those persons already got that skill, so why should we support that? Where's the risk in that? There's plenty of risk in that. And you're giving people opportunities. So your creativity and you're giving opportunities to people, are out the doors. Could be, I don't know. Potentially. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me answer the question with another question. What do you think the biggest risk is in this support relationship that you have with your clients? Both now and under NDIA, I think they're the same. What is the biggest risk that you have as organisations? No, I don't think so. It's irrelevant. Because ultimately, if you haven't built your business structure with some margin so that you can afford to lose a, a risk-adjusted percentage of your clients, bad luck to you, hand me the keys now. What is the key risk? The key risk is delivering a bad life to your participants. Failing to, to deliver human rights to your participants. Failing to deliver choice and control to your participants. Now, if you view risk from that perspective as a board member, yes, the compliance risk becomes important, but it's contextualised because it has to be subservient to the leading of real and meaningful lives for your participants at a dollar point. Okay? Now the fascinating thing is, very few board members in my experience are actually capable of thinking that way. They are captured by compliance, they are captured by DHS1 and other standards, and they are captured by the things that must be done to keep them out of jail or off the front page of the, what's the local paper? Agoniser. Agoniser, cool, excellent. Um, from my perspective, um, is that actually the way to view risk? I don't think so. Not in the longer term anyway. Um, as an outsider to this industry, what I would tend to say is you guys need to start talking the language of risk with your board in a much more proactive way. You need to say this is about an efficiency drive, yes, but it's also about making sure that people don't have bad lives. And a few of you are sitting there going, nah, that's never going to happen with my board. 
That's kind of what you were thinking, wasn't it? No, I'm actually thinking from human rights, not just about the client. I'm local government, okay? I'm also thinking about the human rights of our staff and council and ratepayers and, you know, like it's, it's, it's the whole circle concept coming, flashing before my eyes here. Yep, and not all of that is financial, but some of it is. Okay, so just be aware of that. Uh, I guess what I tend to say with this stuff here, um, how much profit is enough? Um, personally, if you are only keeping up with inflation as a business, uh, you don't deserve a place in this particular market in the longer term because you won't be capable of innovation, you won't be capable of change, you won't be capable of investment in insurance or won't be capable of making yourself uniquely valuable to your clients in the longer term. Probably enough on that. There are some uh, questions there for you. Um, in terms of, actually I'm not, yeah, I'll do this slide, just really quickly. How many of you comply fully with the uh, DHS1 standard? Let me try that again, just because I don't do rhetorical questions. How many of you in your supply arrangements with your participants comply with all material conditions of DHS1? Or everything else that the state government tells you you need to do? Okay, most everybody. I'm going to say actually no, you don't. Because actually if you only complied with DHS1, you would be delivering substantially less quality and less service to your clients. Because if you look at the hard black letter of DHS1, it is actually a very low base, isn't it? It is about survival and safety, nothing else. It is not about human rights. So actually what you guys do is you effectively deliver outstanding quality that is far in excess of what anyone asked for. You are specified to deliver against a quality standard which is DHS1. And effectively you deliver well in excess of that and then moan and complain about the additional cost that is added in delivering that additional quality. Don't you? You are delivering a product that no one asked for. In an NDIA context, this is a bit dangerous, isn't it? Because effectively, NDIA is not going to rescue you if you run out of money by delivering outstanding quality service. So either you charge more for this stuff, or alternatively you potentially look at curtailing the excess quality that you are delivering to what is specified. What is your immediate response as suppliers to that type of concept? Stop over-servicing. Stop over-servicing. Stop doing things that we don't get paid for. Yep. What else? Have a look at workforce, potentially. Have a look at the way that we actually service our clients. There's a whole bunch of different ways to view this. Um, probably flicking on to inclusions and exclusions. Um, the one thing that I would tend to note for those playing at home is this. Um, inclusions and exclusions aren't necessarily terribly important in a DHS context because DHS doesn't typically make you very accountable for the services and supports you are delivering. Is that a fair comment? Yes or no? Yeah, it's fair? Okay. In a situation where you are effectively having to be individually accountable for everything that you do for a client, knowing and understanding what is included and what is excluded before you go through the process of doing every single bit of support that you do becomes kind of crucial, I would have thought. Well, then one other thing to note, the risk of ineligible participants is um, in terms of the emerging trends from, uh, from the, the scheme, what we're beginning to see is it is uh, in ineligible participants are actually pocketed in some particular areas. For those of you who are running ADEs, uh, the ineligible participant rate in Victoria is running as high as high 20s. Okay, so <coughs> please be aware of that. Um, <sighs> Favourite hobby horse of mine, and actually something that I think each and every organisation in this particular gathering is probably guilty of. You tell me that you are outstanding at delivering great quality human rights for your participants. You tell me that that is the thing that your board and your senior management team and your other key members of staff actually value most in the world. You tell me this through your communication, through your internet site, through your one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, spiels to me as an external to the industry. The first thing I go looking for as an external auditor when I get offered a new bit of business in disability is this, I ask for a copy of the board pack. You measure what you treasure. 
folks, and if you're not measuring goal attainment, lifestyle delivered, and human rights, the chances of you measuring, uh, of you treasuring that stuff is almost nothing. You tell me you actually, you, you, you treasure outcomes, and in fact, most of you don't even think to measure it. Now, this slide here was actually put together uh, by Mary Hawkins, who is um, effectively senior in the agency. What is it saying? Effectively, the agency wants to buy these types of supports up here. Supports who are known to be incredibly effective and who have really strong evidence of effectiveness attached to them. How many of you have a good body of evidence-based practice peer-reviewed notes in relation to the effectiveness of your participant supports? Hands up. Daniel's got a half. You've got a half, so we've got a hole in the entire room. Do you know how angry that makes me? You tell me you care about outcomes, and in fact, not only do you not measure them, you don't communicate them to users, and you sure as hell can't tell potential purchasers about them. Without this stuff, you have nothing to sell in an NDIS except for spin. You tell me you're not into spin? Well, okay, show me. Get the evidence-based practice results, please, and be a bit serious about it. Um, mm, probably won't uh, worry too much about that stuff. Evidence-based practice actually becomes uh, really, really important. But continual learning. Um, one of the things that Bev actually pointed to earlier, the whole idea of show me a good idea, tell me about it, let, let, let me feed it back to you, and then let's talk about how it might be embedded into practice. That's about a continually learning organisation. How many of you guys actually have a, a continually learning organisation? It's a really interesting question. Some homework questions for you, please. Um, systems. <clears throat> Pop quiz. Hands up, who's actually got whiz bang, outstanding, excellent uh, infrastructure in terms of business systems, enterprise management, uh, client research, uh, and uh, outcomes measurement? Getting there. Getting there, excellent. Okay, so what caused you to begin the search in terms of getting there? The threat of the NDIS is enough to get most of you off your route. Yeah, this is actually going to be a key thing for you to understand. If you cannot measure time and attendance with your key people on the fly with almost no processing time, you are almost entirely irrelevant to this market. If you cannot in real time manage the productivity of your staff, so how client facing they are against wage time, you are going to be irrelevant in the long term to this particular business. If you cannot, with a minimum of time, effort and energy, capture really outcomes critical uh, notes in terms of client requests, outcomes, wants, needs, goals and aims, as well as their achievement, you are going to be irrelevant to this market. If you can't go through the process of optimising what you do on the basis of very specific lived experience, you probably will be irrelevant to this market by 2020. Getting systems that actually drive this stuff in a streamlined way for very, very low cost is actually absolutely critical. Um, and in some ways, for those of you who haven't invested in this, in this stuff, um, can I make a suggestion? Many of my clients, haven't invested yet. And they're effectively sitting on the sidelines saying, well, you know, it's still three years away, we won't worry too much about it. Actually, if you get good at this stuff now, you'll have a substantially better business by the time NDIA gets implemented. That's important stuff. Daniel. Tim, it's also important to note that it'll take your organisation about a year to actually do the work to get it implemented. That's <laughs> um, with the contract. So that's assuming that your implementation doesn't fail. Um, we have actually seen three large implementations fail in the last six months. All of them were in disability. Do you know why they failed, Daniel? Why? Poor user, thank you. Poor user <laughs> specification, poor documentation, almost non-existent change management, and almost no accountability. One of these projects cost $4 million and still has failed six months later. So you need to understand that Daniel's one year is actually a bit of rosy optimism, which is rare for Mr. Layton. So in some senses, enjoy it while it lasts. And I guess my encouragement to you in terms of systems would be, everyone is looking for the silver bullet. Everyone is looking for the package that does everything. I'm here to tell you that they don't exist, okay? So for those of you who haven't started on this journey yet, um, there are really cheap and easy and straightforward ways to start measuring some of the things that most matter. Workforce mix, client facing efficiency and productivity against targets 
and measuring against contracted purchases, they are some of the key levers and most of you don't even look at that stuff regularly. Sending emails doesn't actually cost very much, so making sure that you gather the data and actually send emails regularly and follow them up consistently is very, very important to your future. And it doesn't require the perfect system, although it would help. Tim, what's a contracted purchaser? Ah, good question. At the moment, um, most of you are funded under a mixture of uh, DHS, DECD, um, possibly some federal grants. Um, and you have a funding and service agreement that covers, in some cases, uh, blocks of activity, in some cases, individuals, and some outcomes. The fascinating thing is, actually, let's, let's do an example rather than making it personal. I went and visited uh, a large client of mine, and uh, uh, I actually thought that it was a really straightforward question. And when I walked in and said, can you give me a list of all the clients that you support and service, how much you are contracted to service in terms of dollars, how much that converts to in terms of hours, what types of support that converts to in terms of hours, where their location is, and what their current percentage of completion is in terms of our completion of, uh, of the year versus our completion of their underlying contract. I thought it was a simple question, right? Because effectively it's just a client list. Do you know what my client's response was? They looked at their shoes for prolonged periods of time because effectively they had no idea. Um, that grieves me greatly because effectively in their business, in a three week period, my clever kids affect a the professionals at Sayward Dawson were entirely able to identify that they have systematically over-serviced some clients, performed some services that were never purchased in the first place for clients that weren't in fact theirs in ways that didn't actually comply with most relevant acts, and to top it off, they'd actually under-invoiced uh, a population of their clients by about 850 odd thousand. When I talk about contract to purchase accountability, it really means this. Know and understand who you're meant to deliver service for and deliver that service. Nothing more, nothing less. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a discipline that you're gonna need to get used to because ultimately under an NDIA, it becomes much hairier and much scarier. Um, working capital. Working capital and cash flow is actually one of these sleeper issues that many of you probably have been ignoring. How many of you are really, really good at doing work, uh, uh, cash flow forecasting um, up to a year in advance? Daniel loves it. He's all over it like a rash. It's excellent. There's a few other people in the room who are really passionate about it as well. Probably typically fellow accountants. I'm really sorry. Um, in some senses, why is this important under an NDIA? Yeah, can, I, can I just say that we only started about 18 months ago in preparation for the NDIS because we were always had the view that we were block funded and the money would come in. It was coming in prospectively. We knew what we were spending on staff. We didn't have to think about it. Sure. And then we realised it was going to change. This is how it's going to change. Effectively, you're funded in advance at the moment. This is what's going to happen under an NDIA unless you actually claim really frequently. Okay. Bottom line here is, folks, there are three things that you can do about managing uh, cash flow risk. The first is to actually shape your balance sheet up a little bit better. The vast majority of you really don't know what that means, so come see me later. Um, the second thing that you can do is claim really frequently. How many times a day does someone who is running a GP super clinic claim from high caps? Thousands. Thousands. They do it on the fly. That's the, that's the nature of high caps, okay? Fascinating thing is, the vast majority of people in the trial sites are claiming how often? Weekly. Weekly, <laughs> no. Monthly, mm, not most supplies. There is one supplier in my cohort who has not claimed yet. Okay? Um, and they complain about working capital and cash flow pressures. They deserve their pressures. Um, Probably enough on that. There are some uh, there are some questions there for you. Um, participant engagement. Um, this may not be an issue for all of you because I'm sure Bendigo suppliers are really really good at this. But for those of you who perhaps aren't, co-design is going to be a really important principle in future. Getting beside your clients, understanding what they really want and need, listening to them, and delivering consistently at a price point, at a location point, becomes somewhat important. And at the moment, how good are you at this? Okay, I will actually admit that was a rhetorical question. Um, competitive positioning. How many of you guys actually have a menu of support services and products by location and by price point where you understand why clients pick you? 
some people in this room have no excuse because I've asked them this question before. But if you don't have a menu of services and if you don't know how you compete or why people pick you rather than other people, chances are you will not actually succeed under an NDIA. People will pick other suppliers. So just be aware of that. Now, some of you are sitting there going, wait a sec, Tim, this time, Chris is actually about to kick me, kick me out. Um, in terms of unique value propositions, most of you are saying people haven't chosen to change in the NDIA trial sites. That's a false positive, okay? Participants, for the most part, haven't known how to change, so therefore, in my opinion, they haven't changed. They've just bought more of the same, okay? Um, from my perspective, unique value propositions and actually competitive positioning becomes super important. Um, ask me at lunchtime about this slide. It's an interesting one. Uh, it's effectively a lifetime map of supports, um, and you guys probably need to understand that different products will actually retain different bits of market uh, leverage and you might need to pick some of the ones that are uh, higher value over That's someone's... That's not your best one. Hey? That's not your best one. That last one. Fine. Um, convergence I'm not going to talk about with this group, but to say, in terms of workforce issues, if you add 14 billion new dollars to a scheme, you add an additional, let's call it $5 million to consumer-directed aged care, you actually roll mental health into the NDIS, which is what's happened, and you go through the process of substantively restructuring community health in the longer term, what do you think is going to happen to workforce pressure? It's going to skyrocket, isn't it? You're effectively going to be competing for the best and brightest across all these industries, not just disability anymore. So I think that's probably important for most of you. Workforce you're already aware of. I guess um, in some senses in wrapping up, um, I've dropped a lot of grenades and kind of encouraged you to chew on them briefly and there's some homework questions for you. I encourage you to actually have a look at them. But I would tend to say this, with my clients, I'm beginning to try and shorten up um, the planning process trying to get quarterly planning done, 100 day plans that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time limited, you actually have only very little time between now and the full implementation of 2016 to 19. Please make the most of that. Um, ultimately, if it is all about the participants, you have an obligation to them and to your organisation to do the next little bit particularly well.